Church, and good morning to all our listeners across the world. Uh, we would like to say a very pleasant Sabbath to you. And incidentally, today we are going to look at the sign of the Sinaitic Covenant, which is the Sabbath. So as I welcome you, um, and as I, um, as we, as we uh, say happy Sabbath to you, um, it is coincidental that we will be looking at the Sabbath in greater detail today as a sign of the Sinaitic Covenant. Um, we would like you to participate in our lesson study today. You can do so by posting your comments on YouTube or in Facebook, and we will try to address as many questions as possible that you would uh, want to ask, and also highlight some of the comments and the contributions you um, you would like to make. So please remember to join us and to participate in our study this morning. Um, I have with me on the panel today, um, Elder Gerald Graham is with us again, and uh, we have Elder Glendine Shepherd. She is with us yet again. And uh, we have a new panel member today, Sister Zodwa. Welcome Sister Zodwa to this uh, panel. And uh, there are some experts on this panel. So uh, I want to let you know that. And therefore, um, sometimes you might struggle to get in some comments between um, Elder Glendine and Oksana. And, and Ella Graham, who sometimes tend to dom dominate the, 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 the lesson. However, <laughs> we will give you ample time to, to make your contributions today. So welcome to our panel. And we have with you yet again, Oksana Thomas. And um, the, we are going to take you through the lesson for today. This is the ninth lesson in this series of studies. And today we will be looking at the covenant sign. And the memory text says, therefore the Lord Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual sign. And, and, and I wanted to read something um, from the lesson study on the Monday, on the Sabbath, last um, Sabbath, the 22nd. And it says, with unceasing regularity and with and with no exceptions, the Sabbath silently hurls over the horizon into every crack and cranny of our lives. It reminds us that every crack and cranny belongs to our maker, the one who puts us here, the one who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth and acted an act that remains, sorry, I, 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 I missed that an act that remains the irrefutable foundation of all Christian beliefs and of which the seventh day Sabbath is the irrefutable, unobtrusive and unyielding sign. So we will look at that today, but before we do so, let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we wanna thank you for this opportunity to delve into your words. We open ourselves to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. For of course, we would have studied, oh Father, but sometimes in our studies, we develop our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own interpretations of your word, your words. But today, oh Father, we want to surrender and those things, and to, and to respond to your promptings, your thoughts, your guidance. What is it you want us to get from this lesson? It is your word, O oh Father, and therefore we leave it to you to give us the interpretation of your own words. So Father, as we, as we study today, let your spirit guide us in our deliberations, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Right, now, before we get into the nitty gritty of the lesson this morning, I just want to ask you a, a couple of questions. When uh, did the Sabbath exist before or after sin? That is, uh, that is before or after Lucifer sinned in heaven. Um, um, and, 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 and I'm going to give you these periods and you tell me, when do you think the Sabbath existed? Did it exist before or after sin? That is before or after Lucifer sinned. 
Did the Sabbath exist before or after human sin? That is before Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. Or did the Sabbath exist before or after the covenant with Adam? Uh, where do you place the Sabbath? Well, I was waiting for someone to start since um, Elder Leslie says that I dominate the, the, the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I personally placed the Sabbath after Lucifer sinned, but before Ma uh, man sinned. Okay. Any, 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 uh, you guys are all in agreement that the Sabbath uh, came after Lucifer sinned, but before man sinned. Um, can I say something to my understanding? I think Sabbath um, existed before sin. Because what does Sabbath mean? It means rest. When you look at, especially with the uh, ceremonies and the, um, the laws that were given to the children of Israel, that the year of the Sabbath, that the land will be at rest, no war and everything like that. So heaven before sin was a place of rest. No war, peace, and harmony. But when uh, Satan sinned, he broke the law of harmony, of rest. The sabbatismus was broken at that moment. I think uh, Sister Zodway is technically right in that um, the concept of Sabbath was always there. The concept of, of rest and fellowship and communion with God was always there because that's what the angels did. They, they communed with God. They, they fellowshiped with God. So the concept of the Sabbath was there, but the covenantial Sabbath um, mm -hmm. lasted after Lucifer sinned and before um, Adam uh, sinned. Yeah. So between Adam and, and Lucifer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, can I just, just kind of say, I, I'm going to sort of tie in both of both concepts that have already been shared and but I, I went straight to the story of redemption and and the title god's eternal law and it says the law of god existed before man was created the angels were governed by it satan fell because he transgressed the principles of god, god god's government after adam and eve were created god made known to them his law it was not then written but was rehearsed to them by Jehovah. The Sabbath of the fourth commandment was instituted in Eden. After God had made the world and created man upon the earth, he made the Sabbath for man after Adam's sin and the, and falls not, and after Adam's sin and fall, uh, sorry, after Adam's sin and fall, nothing was taken from the law of God. The principles of the 10 commandments existed before the fall. That's as Glenn said, the principles of the 10 commandments existed before the fall. Um, and were the character suited um, to the condition of the holy order of beings. After the fall, the principle of those precepts were not changed, but additional precepts were given to man to meet his fallen state. So it sort of ties in what, they, what is both being said. Yes, the principle existed on the Sabbath before yeah. the fall, um, um, but it was particularly instituted in the Garden of Eden for man and additional precepts were added as well in order to to govern man's fallen state uh so yes um it existed um in its principle um angels were governed by it um but it was additionally it was it was um given literally given after man's fallen state um with additional precepts to govern their fallen state okay oksana um there's a question that came in from YouTube and I would like to answer it. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So why do we keep Friday night holy? And the answer is, um, humans, because we're not exactly nocturnal, we have conditioned our bodies, and I'm going to be controversial, in a very evolutionary way, where we class a day and a night as a day however in genesis chapter one it states and after every day it says that so the evening and the morning were the fifth day or the sixth day or the fourth day 
So the way that we observe the Sabbath day is from an evening to a morning. So from sunset to sunset, not from sunrise to sunrise. So the Sabbath day, why we keep this Friday night holy is because it's from Friday sunset, the evening, to Saturday sunset, the morning. Okay. And that is what we constitute as a day, just to answer that question. And somebody said the Sabbath was placed before sin. Uh, where we were talking about, uh, the question was whether it was the sin of, of, of Lucifer, Lucifer yeah. or sin of man. And I'm not sure which sin the uh, person who commented is talking about. I, I do agree that the principles of the Ten Commandments were, the principles of the law existed before. And, and, but we need, to, we need to define what, that, what is the principle of the law. Uh, 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 because, of course, to be talking about a law that says, thou shalt not commit adultery, being as it is written before man sinned, the question of adultery would have been a meaning, meaningless um, a statement in, in heaven. What does committing adultery, thou shalt not commit adultery, means in, in the context of heaven? There is no marriage. There is no... Um, uh, uh, sex, there is no uh, desire for sex. So the question of 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 uh, adultery, as stated in the Ten Commandments, would have been a meaningless concept in heaven. But Christ defines the principle of the Ten Commandments. He says, "You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and love your neighbor as yourself." That was the principle that governs the law. That is what. Christ sums up the law to be. So the, the law of love existed before, um, um, before even um, Lucifer sinned. However, the Bible is very clear as to when God created the Sabbath. He says that after God, the Bible says that after God worked for, for six days in the creation of the world, he, 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 he went on to do, that is the physical creation of the world. He went on and he created another day. He created the seventh day and the Lord rested on that seventh day. The, the Bible talked about after he had done all the creation of his work, he rested on that day. And he did that before man sinned, but he did it after Satan sin. So between the sin of sin, the fall of Satan and the fall of man, the Sabbath, the seventh day rest was 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 instituted. So I will disagree with you, uh, uh, Azadwa, that the seventh day rest did exist uh, before, because God. There might have been some reason, and we will explore the reason of why God would have needed to to create a day of rest for human sin humans who had not yet sinned so that's the key thing the, the the day of rest was created prior to the sin of human beings in the in the God. so the first thing he did after his creation he created a sabbath this day of rest and jesus said and jesus alluded to that when he said the sabbath was created for man so God created man, and then he said, you know what? I'm going to give man something else. I'm going to give man the Sabbath. So God created the Sabbath for man. He didn't create the Sabbath, and then he said, you know what? For the sake of the Sabbath, I'm going to create man. You understand? He says, for the sake of man, I'm going to create the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was made for man, according to Jesus, and not man for the Sabbath. So I think that the Sabbath, in my opinion, the Sabbath came before the fall of man. And, and um, but, so that's where I think it existed. It existed prior to sin. And I really want to establish that idea, that prior to sin, there was a Sabbath. And then we will try to see later if there is any connection between um, sin and the Sabbath, bearing in mind that the origin of that the original creation of the sin was Sabbath was before man sinned. 
So is there any connection between sin and the Sabbath? But we want to, we are talking about the covenant sign today and, and, and we want to get to that. So we have placed the Sabbath, I think. I, I don't know if I convinced my colleague uh, Zodwa about uh, that, but. <laughs> okay, uh, the thing, what I, what I realized is that the Sabbath, uh, the concept, as my sister said, the concept of the Sabbath existed before, but the day, the day that was uh, set aside, it existed before sin, after creation. So the concept of resting in, jo in God uh, was, was, was created before. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and later there is a question to deal with that in the earth made new. And we will see how that rest fits in and, 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 and what was uh, talked about. In, just just in to add on that one, four. you know, when you, you mentioned earlier that the, the commandment of adultery would not uh, work before sin, because there wasn't any before man, before man, that. before man was created, yes. Oh, before man was created. But when we look at in the Bible, God always um, gives us this picture that when we are not faithful to Him, we are being we are playing hollow trick. You know, it it's all about the relationship between us and our Maker, not the physical act. I would say. Okay. Okay. I think okay. Just, yes, just I like that. Just to elaborate on that, I think. Um, what Gerald said confirms what you're saying, Zodwa, in that the principles were there. So even when it comes to adultery, with adultery, the principle is faithfulness, isn't it? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the principle of faithfulness uh, and the angels being faithful to God was there in heaven, yes? But then um, uh, it, was, it was enhanced afterwards with the actual Ten Commandments, yeah. Yeah. Um, when was the word sign first used in, in the Bible? And, I, and I've got a text, and what was the significance and purpose of it? And the text I've got is Genesis chapter 4 and verse 15. When was the sign, the word sign first used? Uh, Genesis 4, 15, anyone? And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark, or I guess you could say a sign, on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. I'm reading for the New King James Version. Actually, actually, I think the Hebrew word there for mark that was translated mar uh, uh, as mark is actually should be translated as sign. So God put this sign upon Cain, and, and after said any man who kills Cain will be affected in a certain way. Um, what was the purpose of that mark upon Cain? What was that sign intended to do? And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to point out that when we talk about a covenant sign, when God used the word sign in the first occasion, he used it for a particular reason. And therefore, I think that when we see the word sign thereafter, we might have to interpret the word sign in the context of when God first used the word sign. So what was the purpose of this mark or sign upon Cain in your mind? Was it almost to, to kind of set him aside? Because, you know, it, it was the, the sign was that, you know, anybody who see him, they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't put their hand on him kind of thing. So it's almost like, um, yeah, setting, setting, saying apart, sorry, setting, Cain apart, and in I a way, think, I, I think you're looking for a word beginning with P. Protect. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a sign of protection. Yes, because so, so it seems as a, yes. Okay, go ahead. So that's 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 you're absolutely right. That that's another word for it. Um, so he was set aside. He was protected because of that sign. So so that sign was intended to protect Cain. Yes, go ahead. Um. I think that a sign in general, and I think it could apply here, because I'm looking at driving signs, signs on, that you see on the road. A trademark is a sign. That's the, that's the definition of a sign, a distinguishing sign. A sign is a symbol that's supposed to convey a meaning. And so when it comes to the sign that God put on Cain, it's supposed to convey a meaning. And Sister Glendine said, it was a meaning of protection. He's under God's protection. Another sign, like, and I know we're probably going to touch on it later on. Another sign is a rainbow. 
I know that's that's still a sign, but it's still supposed to convey a meaning. Now, what that meaning is can be changed. So, for example, we were supposed to look at a rainbow and think. This is God's covenant that he made with us that he won't flood the earth again. Now, in the 21st century, the, the rainbow as a sign conveys a completely different meaning. So it depends on, like you say, Elder, the, the context that you're looking at the sign in. Because a sign is a symbol, but it's supposed to convey a particular meaning. So Yes, and I'm particularly interested in what God might have intended the meaning to be not necessarily our changing and opinions later, but I think when God put that sign upon Cain, it was intended, the word sign there was intended to mean that this should be, um, um, it's not that there was something special about Cain, but just that God wanted to protect Cain from harm. Now, God put that sign upon him, even though Cain did not repent. You understand? Uh, it was it was it was an initiative by God and not an initiative by the sinner for that sign to be placed for his protection. So it was God who took the initiative to deal with the sinner um, in a particular way. God extended grace to 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 Cain, even Kido Cain had not uh, repented of his act of sin. So that was the first mention of the word sign. Now sign was mentioned again, signs actually, the, 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 the stars and when God created the, the, the sun and the moon and he, he used it for signs and seasons. But let us, let us, let us go a, a, again a little deeper into the, um, the study for this week. And I will go to number four um, in our questions there. Mm -hmm. What is the sign in the covenant with Noah? Now, I'm trying to show that God was establishing covenants as he go along. And for each covenant, he there is an associated sign. So, uh, Oksana, you read, uh, if you can read Genesis chapter 9, verse 12 to 17, as we look at the covenant of Noah, and then look at the associated sign of that covenant. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant, which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud, over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and i will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh the rainbow shall be in the cloud and i will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between god and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Okay. So, so we know what the sign was. The sign was the rainbow. In the what cloud. was the, what was, who were the beneficiaries of this sign, this, 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 this sign and this, this the covenant that was represented by this sign who was the beneficiary and how, and for how long was this sign to last was it to be was it to last just for a period was it to last forever so what was the duration who were the beneficiaries of this sign it's noah's descendants and all the gener generation after that, would that include you Yes, it's, it's of a course. sign forever. Yeah. It was a sign forever. So yeah. that sign is to, is to last forever and for all generations. Mm -hmm. But there was something in particularly important about that sign. And, and, and as Oksana was reading, a word keep coming up over and over and over. God says he will remember. Notice that in that thing, the word remember, 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 keeps coming up over and over and over again. Um, and uh, but the thing is, the memory there was for God. God says, hmm. when I see <laughs> this rainbow in the sky, I will remember my covenant with you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. So the rainbow was to remind God of his covenant. Not to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And notice the word remember. So we are arguing that this sign of the covenant with Noah is a perpetual oh. sign lasting for all generations. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. It is. Good. So, so we've got Noah's sign covered, and we got the <laughs> sign of that covenant that God made with Noah, and what sign was associated with. We know the duration, we know the scope. Now, what is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant? And again, we will discuss its duration and its scope. And this is taken from, so God established his covenant with Noah, and now he established a covenant with Abraham. Genesis 17, 11 to 14. You want me to read it? Yeah, somebody. And ye shall and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every ma man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. So what what verse, Elder Leslie? It was Genesis, what did I say? Genesis 11 to, um, 14. 17, 11 to 14. 14. Okay, so I'm on uh, verse 13 now. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh, is of, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, I, I want to come to that, but first let me read a uh, YouTube comment, and then we'll come to address that issue. The Sabbath is a part of the Ten Commandments. Lucifer broke the commandments. He wanted to worship, worship over God. Therefore, I think the Sabbath was binding in heaven. That's an opinion. I don't think we can justify that from, from, from the scriptures, from scripture. though. The Sabbath law always existed, it seems. But as a lifestyle, the law came in after the lifestyle was messed up. The Sabbath was created for all humanity and it will exist for all generations. Yes, so back to the Abrahamic covenant. Um, so what was the sign of the covenant of Abraham and what, who were to be the people to whom this sign must apply? And is it, what's the duration of that sign? So the sign was circumcision. The sign was circumcision. I agree that mm -hmm. it says, and if a man child is not circumcised, he has broken the covenant. Mm -hmm. Now, is that sign perpetual? Is that sign, uh, who, are, who are the people to whom that sign should apply? Remember the pattern that we have uh, begun to, uh, is, is there a pattern? <laughs> Abraham, we argue that the Noah's covenant are the sign of the rainbow, which still applies today. That sign there applies today. We can still see the rainbow in the sky. Uh, we know it's there um, and we believe it, it applies. Um, what, what, what about the sign of circumcision of the Abrahamic covenant? Is that, is that sign less significant than the other signs that we will discuss today? And what's the duration? I. I know it's a difficult question. All right. I, I'm, uh, I'm looking at the actual. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be careful to not ascribe my own meaning based on what is here. Mm -hmm. From what is in these verses, even from verse nine, it said that the covenant is everlasting. In verse thirteen, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say anything that the sign itself is everlasting. So even though it is a sign, I don't think that we can necessarily automatically assume that the sign of circumcision is everlasting. Just that the covenant itself is an everlasting covenant. So you have separated the covenant. Of course, the covenant and its sign should be separated. They're two separate things. They're two separate covenant things. Covenant and, and, and the sign. But the sign accompanies the covenant so that God will remember this covenant that he has made because of that sign. 
why is it, uh, I'm getting the impression that we are a bit reluctant to, to, to say that the sign of circumcision of the male is a sign that is no longer applicable to us. And if it is no longer applicable, what has replaced it? The, the Bible, um, sorry. Yes. The, uh, the, the Bible makes clear that the circumcision of the flesh Yes, it was a sign for God's, um, well, it was for the, the male covenant. Yeah. Yes, from the, from the um, covenant. But it was, it was an indication of a, um, a greater circumcision, if you like. And the Bible um, explains that as a circumcision of the heart. That's what God, that, and that, yes, in that respect, it's a, a sign in, in perpetuity. It continues. It doesn't stop. You know, even though you saw a physical sign in the flesh, um, but um, the covenant goes on in respect that God's people are to have a circumcision within the heart. So it lasts forever. That particular aspect of it may not last forever, but the sign in itself lasts forever. If yes. you get my understanding. But I, I do agree. I think, I think Paul did make that argument mm -hmm. that it is not the circumcision of the flesh that is important. That is no longer the, 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 the sign. It is a circumcision of the heart. And then we probably have to discuss what it means to be circumcised of the heart. Uh, uh, what meaning would you ascribe to the circumcision of the heart? Go on, Oksana. I just have a quick question then, if that's the case, because um, maybe we don't want to circumcise physically. So that's why we're saying it doesn't apply. My question then is, when did it become, when did it change from a physical circumcision to a circumcision of the heart, i.e. a figurative circumcision? Well, that occurred after Christ died. Yes. After after Christ died, that 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 change had made. Remember, the discussion on the first Jerusalem Council was about whether the Gentiles were required to be circumcised or not. And the conclusion of the of the disciples at that time was that there was no need for the Gentiles to become circumcised. So once the gospel, once the gospel transition from the Jews to the Gentiles. It is during that um, um, transition, and that happens when Christ died there, that the, the meaning of the sign, it is always about the meaning of the sign. The meaning of the sign is to show a relationship between yourself and your God. The sign is to show that relationship between yourself and the God and your God. And therefore, it is the thing that shows that you are his. You understand? So it is the circumcision of the heart that demonstrates that you are his. And that was the mark. That's the sign of, 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 of um, that, you are, that you belong to him. So and I the, think that, that that is when it occurred. Yes, go ahead. I was going to say, and the principle is the, and was established from the beginning. Because if you remember, we talked about, um, you know, the principles of the law being established in heaven, et cetera, but, it, but the uh, tangible um, outpouring of that was different um, um, after creation, yeah? yeah? So in the same way, the principle of circumcision and, and that covenant was always, as, as Gerald says, will always be there, yes? But the tangible outpouring of that is, was different. You're absolutely right, Elder Leslie, after the cross. And, and, and you would notice also in that sign of the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham was a sign in the flesh. Mm. What God does not require a sign in your flesh. Mm. He requires a sign in your heart. Right. And that's where the, the, the sign remains. So I think that the sign of the Abrahamic covenant is still applicable to us today, but in the sense of the circumcision of the heart, as Paul argued, rather than the circumcision of the flesh, because we are interested in the heart. And, and next week's study talked about the, the new covenant, and we will touch on that today. And we will see where the sign of that covenant is. Um, now, the lesson focus essentially on the Sinaitic covenant, the covenant at Sinai. 
And it says in, and I'll read that, in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 16, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and Israelites forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now, why would the Lord use the Sabbath as a covenant sign? Uh, what it is about the Sabbath that makes it an appropriate symbol as a sign? What makes the Sabbath this appropriate symbol? Now, think about the, the sign of the rainbow. We always see the rainbow. Repeatedly, we see the rainbow. You understand? Repeatedly, we see the rainbow. In the, in the, in the uh, Abrahamic sign, then the sign was a perpetual reminder. Every male child that was born had his foreskin severed. And that was always there. Every day when a baby is born and think, that sign is there. That sign is present in my flesh. It's constantly there. Now, the sign of the Sabbath. Why is the Sabbath sign such an appropriate symbol? So the Sabbath is something that is perpetually there. It's, it comes, as, we, as you mentioned, right at the very beginning, um, Elder. It's, it's every week. You know, it's something, it's a reminder that happens every week. It also points to who the maker of the Sabbath is. It, it, we, you know, it's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Yeah. So the 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 author, the maker of the of the creator of the Sabbath, is represented there. The um, the fact that the Sabbath is um, is a regular reminder every week is 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 there as well. Also, it the, the Sabbath um, it encompasses. So many things, in, you know, the lesson talks about sanctification and deliverance. All of that is wrapped up in the Sabbath. So all of what God is, if you like, is wrapped up in the Sabbath that happens on a weekly basis. And so therefore, that's why it's, it's a, a, an appropriate, if you like, sign of God. Okay. What is it that God wants us to remember? That he is the creator. God wants who made us, us to remember that he's the creator. Mm -hmm. He also wants us to remember that he is the one that sanctifies us. As it says in, in, in verse 13, that is the purpose of the sign of the Sabbath, that all of your generation should know that I'm the one who sanctifies you. Nobody else can give you that. Nobody else can um, perform that purpose. So by it being a perpetual sign, it is representative, I think, of God's continuity as a deity that he is the only one who can perform the purpose of sanctifying us as human beings. Yes, I was looking, okay, I found it now. I'm looking at Deuteronomy chapter yes. five, and I, I want to get back to a point uh, uh, Sister Zadwa made. Um, Observe the Sabbath to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. And then it went on. But the Sabbath, well, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It continue with that. And then in verse 15, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And that the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God command you to keep the Sabbath day. Now, when this commandment was made in Exodus chapter 20, the reason given was because God created the heavens and the earth. He created the, he was the creator. Again, in Deuteronomy, he reemphasized the fact that God created the earth in seven days, but he added something else. It's the redeemer. He reminded, yes, that he was the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt. So here we see God wants us, and remember, he brought them out, it says, with a mighty hand. God wants to send a message to the Sabbath that he is, he wants us to understand who he is. That's really <laughs> what it's all about. God wants his people to know 
who God is. He wants to reveal himself to us. And God's re revelation of himself is found neatly in that Sabbath commandment. Remember that day existed before we sinned. Mm. But as also, I think, I think the, the thing about it for me as well is also the Sabbath demonstrates that God wants a relationship with us. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to. Um, he wants us to be part of of his um, of everything that he is. You know, he wants us to enter into that rest with him. It's a joint thing. It's a relationship, and I think that is so um, key as well. Because it, this high God, this mighty God, this powerful deliverer, this powerful person, actually wants to have communion with me. This lowly. Um, um, insignificant as far as I'm concerned human being I think that's just awesome because you know I, I, yeah I just think it's awesome <laughs> yes this 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 Sabbath commandment is it's it's regular appearance every week because it is the only remember the law the law on the guards the ten the, the decalogue on the on the guards the uh, the covenant God made with Israel at Sinai. And then God reached into the law and he pulled out one of those commandments and he said, I'm going to use this commandment as the sign of the covenant between us. And the question we have to go back to is we've been asking about all uh, of these signs. Who were the beneficiaries and for how long what is the duration of this sign? The Sabbath sign. Who is to benefit from this? We saw all flesh, living flesh, was to benefit from the, uh, uh, the covenant with, with Noah. Who is to benefit from this Sabbath sign, this covenant? And for how long it's supposed to last? Is it temporary? Is it for a period? Is it for a particular group of people only? The, it's... It's for all those who choose to enter the covenant relationship with God. You know, I mean, a covenant is an agreement. An agreement denotes harmony, you know, and I think that's God's whole purpose of, you know, um, and at the center of the covenant is God wants to bring everybody in harmony with himself. And, and that's for anybody who chooses to, to enter into that relationship. God doesn't force, he cannot force harmony. You cannot force harmony. It's something that you have to choose that you want. It's like when a choir comes together, different parts and within themselves, they sing wonderfully. But when they come together, you know, in agreement and they sing, you know, it, it's, it's a beauty to hear, you know, and that's what God wants for each of us to be a part of that choir. So... I yeah, think, go ahead. I, I was gonna say I agree. I think the covenant is is it's the Sabbath. It's for all of us. The beneficiaries are everyone mm -hmm. who 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 accepts that covenant and who wants to enter into that rest with God. Gerald's absolutely right in that God will not force us. He will not, you know. But but it's there, and through His grace, He's offering it to everybody. So it's a it's for us to accept it. Is it perpetual? Yes. 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 So it is not a, a, a sign that is going to come to an end at a certain time in, well, in, in human well, existence. Well, now, now that depends, Elder, on what... <laughs> you see, in the same way, you had the concept of the Sabbath in heaven, yes? And then it was uh, tangible, made into a day when uh, on earth. When we get to heaven, yes, we'll no longer need a day to to uh to worship god and to to uh, a day that's set aside it's going to be a, almost like a continuous sabbath if you like because we're going to be continuously with him we're going to be continually in in his rest in his presence uh communing with him and fellowshipping with him so the day so i think for, for me when we get to heaven it will transition again from being a day to being a perpetual sign something that is is continuous Okay, I, I, I noticed, and Zodwa, briefly you hinted at this, that the Sabbath was also to be a, a, a sign of redemption. Um, we see um, God added that section about bringing them out of the land of Egypt. 
into Canaan, redeeming them from slavery, um, um, that redemptive nature of the Sabbath, because you want this sign to be remembered because it is redemptive in nature. I want to, I must read, because at the beginning of the lesson, and, 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 and maybe somebody should read Hebrews chapter four, verse one to four. At the beginning of the lesson, we did talk a bit about um, the, um, about rest. Because you remember God rested from his work uh, when he created the seventh day. It's not that I personally feel that God needed physical rest because I don't know what is going to tire God, but he did rest. What was the purpose of that rest? Let us see if we can identify that in Hebrews chapter four, verse one to four. You want me to read that? Yes. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem, seem, to, seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached, this is a New King James Version, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those, in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works are finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. That's right. So, so here the author of Hebrew is associating the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, with a perpetual rest. You, we've got to see the connection here. When before man sinned, God had created a day of rest. This day of rest was unconnected with sin because man had not sinned as yet. But the Sabbath, the day of rest was created even though man had not sinned. And here in Hebrews, the author is arguing that they remain it. A rest for us. The same type of rest identified by the seventh day, the last verse of that text that you read in verse four. So the Sabbath is about resting in God. And we needed that rest before we sinned when the Sabbath was created. We need it even more while we are sinners. And we will still need to have that rest in God after we would have been redeemed from sin. So the Sabbath rest is perpetual throughout the time of human existence. From the time he was created, the Sabbath given us rest, during our, our sojourn here on earth, and even after Hebrews is arguing that this resting in God is the key to what the Sabbath is offering. Think the Sabbath will be kept in heaven every day in heaven will not be a Sabbath. Somebody made that comment. Um, remember Adam and Eve had six days to do their work. The seventh day would be a hollow day for us to commune with God. I, I mean, that may be true, but I, 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 when Adam and Eve was created, they were created on the sixth day and God gave them a rest the next day. They didn't even begin to work. So we are associating work with the rest in the Sabbath, which is something that I don't agree with. They hadn't begun yet to work and God had given them a rest. So if it is, the rest is because you are working, that's a misunderstanding of the rest of the Sabbath. It's not a cessation only from work. It's a resting in God. It's not a cessation of rest. Because God should have waited until Adam and he started working and then give them the rest. But give them the rest the very next day before the work began. So we rest before we worked. Not that we worked and then rest. The rest of the Lord is independent of our working. Right. I just want to move on a little bit more. We got a few, uh, uh, about eight minutes more. And I want to look, um, even though this is a next week's study, 
I want us to look at the new covenant. I, I noticed that Sister Zodwa has decided to, to, to rejoin us. Welcome back. <laughs> She's having some technical difficulties. Um, let us look at the new covenant and what is the sign of that new covenant? Um, shall we read Hebrews chapter 8, 7 to 13? Hebrews 8, 7 to 13. Somebody? I'll, I'll read it. I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version. It says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. God finds fault with them when he says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them from the land of um, by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I have no concern for them, says the Lord. This is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. To what verse was that? 13. And they shall not teach, um, and they shall not teach one another to say um, to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For I'm um, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete? The, the growing old will soon disappear. So th this new covenant, God is to write it upon our hearts. Okay? And I will write my uh, law upon your hearts and so on. What is the sign of that covenant? Do you notice any sign? in that text that would indicate what is the sign of the covenant. I, I did ponder upon that because every previous uh, covenant, there was a sign associated with that covenant. Uh, the rainbow, the circumcision, the Sabbath was associated with the Sinaitic covenant. But we are under this new covenant. What is the mark of that sign? Is it that he's putting the, the law in their, in their minds and writes in their hearts? That is, the, that is the statement of the covenant. But what's the statement of the sign? In fact, I did not find... <laughs> I did not find... Um, that um, sign in in that covenant, and therefore, I, I in the book of Romans, chapter eight, verse fourteen, and then again in verse sixteen, I think that is where the sign of this new covenant would be. This sign must be written in your heart, and 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 and, and so forth. Uh, this covenant, and it says in verse fourteen, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are God's. And verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I think that the sign of the covenant, because remember, all of these signs are pointing out who God's people are. Remember, mm -hmm. when they circumcised the flesh, it was pointing out that they belong to God. You understand? If you keep the Sabbath, it's an indication that you are God's. What is it that is an indication that we belong to God? The presence of the Spirit in our lives. Yes. For as many as are led by yes. the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the sign of this new covenant, in my opinion, is the Holy Spirit in you. If you have the Holy Spirit, you are God's. You belong to him. That is what identifies you. What identifies the, 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 the Jews, the Israelites? 
the, the mark of circumcision in their flesh. That shows who they were, that they are part of God's people. What shows that you are part of God's people today? I just want to do this great. Yes, go on. Sorry, go ahead. Just to add on that, uh, Elder, when we were asking that question, I, I just linked this, um, as you said, that the presence of the Holy Spirit is the sign. But to me, when I was looking at it, I look at the um, Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23, the fruit of the Spirit, not only one, but the whole package because it shows the indwelling of Christ in our lives. When I say the whole package, because I'm looking at also the example that is given to us, when God speaks to Moses in Exodus 34, verse six and seven, when he passes by before him, he mentions his name. If you look at the fruit of the spirit and the name of God is one thing. So the indwelling of God in us is only seen by the, those fruits. And, and, and I wanna make a statement here as we go on, as we head in towards the close, that might appear controversial because really someone, the devil don't care if you worship on the Sabbath, providing you worship him. Many people worship on the Sabbath. Those people who nailed Jesus to the cross, you understand? Mm -hmm. Who gave him up to be killed. They were Sabbath keepers, weren't they? It's not about the keeping of the Sabbath alone. The devil don't really care if you worship on the Sabbath, providing you worship him. However, if you have the spirit in you, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, that's in the, an indication of who you are. The devil is concerned about that. He, he, he cares about whether you have got the spirit because he doesn't want you to have the spirit, which is the mark of the new covenant between God and his people. Even though the Sabbath is important, sometimes you got so preoccupied with Sabbath, 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 and we miss the it's fact perfect. that it is not a day that is so important. It is the relationship you have. And who brings about that relationship between us and God? It is the Holy Spirit. In it. And we talk about this covenant of grace. That is the covenant of grace. This covenant that was at Sinai is not necessarily the covenant of grace. Grace, the, the dispensation of grace came about when Christ died at Calvary. That was now, we are now in the dispensation of grace. And the covenant that covers this dispensation of grace is the new covenant as identified here in Hebrews chapter 8. And the sign of that covenant is the Holy Spirit. Next week, there will be going to be a larger discussion on this matter. And I want to just um, read a couple of comments and then we will conclude. But God worked for six days. That's why he himself rested on the Sabbath, though Adam and Eve had not yet worked. And another one, God has given us a responsibility on earth. The Sabbath day would be a day where everyone come together to rejoice in God's greatness and worship God. I, I, I'm sure we will agree with that, that when you enter into your Sabbath worship, you must remember that the foremost thing in that relationship is a relationship with God and that it identifies who God is, not only as creator, but also as redeemer. That is what the Sabbath is to teach us, that we are involved in, a, in the creator God in a redemptive, sanctifying relationship. May God bless you. And I want to thank our panelists for the discussion this morning. May God bless you all. Thank you.